thank you for making it to the Warden Undergraduate Entrepreneurship Club's first speaker event of the year. I'm Vivek, one of the co-presidents here. Just for some background, our club hosts some of the most renowned entrepreneurs and startup investors in the world. We also run one of the largest startup incubators on campus, and we hold workshops to refine skills like pitching and recruiting, and we have an upcoming pitch competition. So our club offers a lot. Today is a very special day because we have general partner at Excel, Amit Kumar here with us today. Just for some info, Excel is a leading early and growth stage venture capital firm known for making early bets on Facebook, Slack, Spotify, which I'm sure you use every day. Amit was previously co-founder of a payment startup called Cardspring, which got acquired by Twitter. He then worked as an engineering manager at Twitter and in 2016, he joined Excel. So at Excel, his investments focus on software, fintech, and healthcare. So if you're interested in any of those industries, you gotta reach out. Some of his deals include Chainalysis, which is valued at $4.2 billion, and Smash, which got acquired by Microsoft. And moderating this discussion, we have our very own Professor Rosenkopf, who is Vice Dean of Entrepreneurship here at Warden. So the way this is gonna work is we'll start off with Professor Rosenkopf asking Amit questions, and then we'll have Q&A from the audience towards the end. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to Amit and Professor Rosenkopf. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Vivek, and the club for putting this event together. Amit, it's wonderful to be sitting beside you in the virtual Zoom format and to get a chance to know each other. And I saw that you're an engineer by training. I am too. So tell us about the pivots in your career. Vivek just gave us the, the quick bullet point LinkedIn sort of profile, but help us understand, first of all, uh, when you left school, why did you decide to go to a big tech company like Microsoft, uh, as opposed to what, what seems to be in your heart, which is founding? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, everyone, really appreciate you giving me the time and, you know, the, the space to sort of tell my story of, you know, obviously have a lot of respect for UPenn and a lot of my colleagues and folks I work with uh, are from UPenn. And so I just think it's an amazing institution. So it's a real privilege to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, so the, the background on me is, uh, you know, I'm an immigrant. I was born in India, moved to this country, went to public school my whole life, um, and went to Cal. And then sort of post-Cal, I went to Microsoft. Um, it, the year, so I graduated college in 2003. I would, sort of, I, I would say sort of the answer is a couple things. Like, number one, it wasn't really obvious to go to startups in 2003. I know that it's sort of hard to imagine that today where, you know, so many of the most exciting companies are private companies. But, you know, at the time, it was sort of like Google. Uh, and not much else. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of the most exciting companies at the time, uh, it were it was large tech companies. And Microsoft was Microsoft is exactly what you think of Google today. It's just sort of the dominant tech player in the community. You know, with all the mo you know most important products, we were all buying software on CDs. You know, Windows was the most important operating system. It's just a very different world than the one that we live in today. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's probably like lots of lessons in it for me and myself. Like, I didn't run a really thorough process. You know, Microsoft was sort of top of top of the food chain for me, and I got the job, and it was a really compelling offer, and so I just took it. Um, you know, I wish I'd run a bit more of a process and been a little bit more thoughtful about how I did it. I will say, in retrospect, I think starting your career at a big company is awesome. I mean, I think there's just like a lot of benefits to doing so um, versus just pursuing entrepreneurship right out of the gate. Um, you know, when you work at a big company you really learn how to be a professional. You learn how to be an engineer. I mean, there's just so many aspects of being an engineer that aren't really taught at school. You know, it's like, how do you participate in meetings? How do you write great emails? How do you communicate? How do you collaborate in a team, you know, outside of a group of two or three or four that you do a project with, you know, being a professional is much more than problem sets or even writing algorithms. I mean, the reality is a lot of it is code reviews and just, you know, getting shit done and really just connecting pipes from, you know, here to there. And so it's, it's, it's a very different skill set. And I think being an engineer at a real company really teaches you those things. And it also just gives you a grounding in terms of real world problems. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, I mean, of course, UPenn's an incredible institution. I'm sure you're running across lots of ideas, but there's nothing quite like being at a great company and seeing the problems that matter and being like closer to bare metal effectively. Um, and then the, the other sort of key key thing that you sort of figure out by working at a big company versus sort of starting something of your own right away is you really build a great network. So, you know, today, 
You know, if you were to leave UPenn and go to a great company, it doesn't have to be Microsoft or Google, actually. It could be Stripe or Robinhood or any of these companies. You know, you're really building out your network. Um, you know, I, I'm sure we'll get to this. I run a mentorship program at UC Berkeley called the Excel Scholars Program. And so I am frequently talking to students who are your age. Um, I do it like all the time, in fact. And the way I sort of phrase it is, I consider it like doing your master's degree. So like go, go do your master's degree at Stripe, mm -hmm. go do your master's degree at Microsoft. And I think if you view it as an institution of higher learning rather than just a job, I think you'll really understand the value that you can get out of going to a great company to begin your career. I mean, your career is going to be 40 or 50 years long, right? So like you don't have to score a touchdown on the first play of the Super Bowl. Like you can actually go get a first down and you can build out your network. You can build up your skills. And so um, that was sort of the, the point of view I have now about like working at big companies. I think it's great. It, it makes a lot of sense. And, and from Microsoft, you went and you found to two different startups. How did you know it was time to switch from the big world at Microsoft yeah. to your own startups? Yeah, I, but for, first of all, like my career is definitely not up into the right. There's like all sorts of mistakes. And, you know, I mean, the, the good news is Silicon Valley like forgives those mistakes and you get lots of chances to figure it out. You know, I knew it was time to leave Microsoft because I think I'd stopped learning. And that's not to say that I would have not learned if I'd stayed another 10 years. I just think the rate of learning had slowed down and it felt like there were other challenges to go after. And I think, you know, in your heart, you'll know when the right time is to leave a company like you've sort of been through. For me, I'd been there about three years, three and a half years. I'd been through an entire ship cycle. I know that doesn't make any sense today, but let me explain it. Now we ship a hundred times a day, but back in the day we shipped one time every three years. So you would literally work on the product and then we'd burn it to CDs and sell it. That sounds crazy, I know, uh, but that's what we did. And so I went through an entire ship cycle and it just felt like the right time to move on. Um, I started a company for almost all the wrong reasons. I mean, like the, the most important one was people had told me for a long time that I should start a company. You know, I was an engineer, great, um, but I was, you know, very extroverted. I really enjoyed being with people. I was, you know, sort of, I had, I really enjoyed being a leader and, and, and all of those things, qualities I'm sure all of you have effectively. But, you know, at the time I I'd, I'd really just listened to that. And so I jumped in with two feet and started a company with one of my close friends. And, you know, we made, I think every conceivable mistake you can make. Um, the reality is today, and I think, I think we totally take it for granted how much core startup wisdom and starting a company wisdom is just open source. You know, whether it's Paul Graham's essays, whether it's like startup, you know, uh, classes that are taught at different places that are all on YouTube, you know, whether it's founders that are building in public on Twitter, there's just so much common knowledge. And when I was starting companies that just didn't exist. And so we were still piecing it together almost. And so, you know, I started with a buddy of mine. We were totally bootstrapped. We made all sorts of mistakes. We were afraid to tell people our ideas because we thought they would steal them, which is like so absurdly ridiculous. I can't even explain it. You know, we just, we just made all sorts of mistakes and we were optimizing for the wrong things. And so, you know, but I did enjoy, I did enjoy sort of the idea that you would connect, kind of control the outcome and that you had a lot more, you know, you had a lot more influence on the outcome and obviously you have a lot more reward if it goes really well. And so I was really, bitten by the startup bug and wanted to do it again and again, but I wanted to do it better. And so one of the ways, you know, one of the key ways that I wanted to change what we were doing was, you know, this was a bootstrap company. Bootstrap, by the way, means that like we were self-funding. And so when you're self-funding, A, you're not making any money because you're not going to pay yourself with your own money. That's stupid, right? So <laughs> you're, you're just trying to make money effectively. And, you know, we were just cutting all sorts of corners. And, uh, you know, ultimately as an engineer, you have unbelievable you know, opportunity costs. Like you can go work at any of these great companies and make tons of money and be like really comfortable and whatnot. So if you're going to start a company, I mean, really go for it, right? Like, and so in my view, I wanted to do something that was venture backed and raise capital. And so I met Chris Griffin. Chris Griffin's a UPenn grad, uh, 2004. And we started this company and the company was called Bettable. And Bettable was almost the most polar opposite to what I was doing previously. It was like the most ambitious thing we could think of. It's the year 2008 and, or 2007, and in 2007, Web 2.0 is kind of a new phenomenon. Facebook's kind of hit the, hit the ground running. You know, these companies are growing massively from a user growth point of view, but it was really unproven whether they could make revenue, whether they could make money. And so we paired up all of the sort of user mechanics and growth and user generated content mechanics with a really highly profitable category, which was gambling. And so Bettable was an online gambling social network. I know that sounds crazy, but there are lots of people doing it now. And it's kind of frustrating because <laughs> we got there first, but we screwed it up. Um, we ended up raising $5 million, including a Series A led by Atomico. Atomico is a venture capital firm based in the UK. It's sort of the founders of Kazaa and um, Skype. 
uh, is, is what they're most known for. But as part of that process, it was, it, was, it was an incredible process for me. I mean, we pitched all the VCs in the Valley, including Excel. Um, but, you know, we pitched, you know, Excel and Kleiner Perkins and Founders Fund and Benchmark and all the top VCs. And it was a really incredible experience. You know, we built out the whole team. We went, you know, we built out a product. We, we, we met so many of the people that are, that are famous now in Silicon Valley, but we're just getting their start. And, you know, it was, it was really one of the most magical times I think in my career is like, you know, really getting to do it, you know, with, with like a real budget and someone who really backs your project. And after Bettable comes card spring. Yeah. What, what happened with Bettable at the end of it? It didn't work. I mean, that's kind of the bottom line. Uh, we did it for a while. We did it for about three or four years. And then we kind of ran out of steam and money, but mostly steam. I mean, you know, startups end when you kind of give up. Uh, but my founder, my co-founder, Chris, didn't give up. He actually recapped the company, started from scratch, kind of pivoted it to a different concept. You know, ultimately that didn't work out either. But I don't know if you guys have seen the movie 300. At the beginning of the movie 300, <laughs> basically they have this scene where Leonidas is thrown out of the city walls and like he has to go like hunt a wolf or something and he has to cut, kill it and come back. And that's how I felt. You know, I'm just like a stubborn person and it's really hard emotionally to just like admit failure and to come back and just be like, hey, I'll just go join Google now, I guess. That's what's up, right? Like, it's just really hard to do that. And I really felt like I was getting better at it, you know? And so three of us from Bettable, we decided to take another shot at it. We really enjoyed working together and we went back to Excel and we went back to Excel because, you know, honestly, I had fallen in love with them through the sort of fundraising process, even though they had sort of turned us down for investment. There was someone there who I thought was really special and his name is Andrew Bracha and I wanted to work with him. I, he was the best person. If I could have picked anyone to back our company at Bettable, it would have been him. And so we went back to Excel and we got paired up with an EIR and EIR basically means an executive in residence, entrepreneur in residence. He's someone that the firm has decided they would like to back. And they're just like, Hey, why don't you hang out here and think about stuff and we'll give you money when you come up with a good idea. And so the three of us joined him. His name is Eckerd. And so the four of us basically were brainstorming ideas. And so the year now is 2010 and in 2010 Stripe has just been founded. Square has just done a series A and Groupon is the fastest growing company of all time, okay? So that's sort of the, the era that we're in. And so we decided to do something at sort of the intersection of payments where there was a ton of innovation happening and online to offline advertising effectively, right? Which is sort of what Groupon was doing. And so Cardspring was some sort of Groupon competitor, honestly, um, but it was, you know, and it was backed by Excel and Greylock. Those are two really great firms. And, you know, we, we, we sort of had a great setup um, but in the process of building that consumer product, you know, we, we realized that the actual core technology was dramatically more valuable. And in particular, what was valuable about it was our ability to see uh, was how we access payment data real time. So effectively, what Cardlinked offers are, just to, just to explain it really fast, is we, could, we were detecting transactions in real time. And we could send you a webhook anytime it happens. So if I wanted to know, or rather, not if I wanted to know, but if anyone, so if Lori wanted to know real time programmatically when Vivek was shopping at you know Best Buy for more than $100 on a Wednesday, like I could do it. I could send her a webhook real time, literally before it even hit Visa that that was happening. And you know she could apply a discount on his purchase. She could you know execute arbitrary code or whatnot. And the idea was to correlate online you know, browsing activity with offline purchases. That was that was sort of the idea behind Cardspring. And so we ended up raising a big Series A. You know, we 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 sort of did the whole TechCrunch disrupt thing. I don't know if you guys have seen the show Silicon Valley, but that was very much PTSD for me because you know we were there and we we had lots of presentations. It was it, it was nuts. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, we launched at South by Southwest. Like we really did the damn thing. We had thirty or forty people at the company. We had partnerships with Foursquare. Um, we had partnerships with tons of people throughout the Valley. We actually had partnerships. Um, I wish I could show you this video because it's, it's killer. Um, it's, a, it's a video of Cardify presenting at TechCrunch Disrupt. Uh, Cardify was one of the many companies that was built on top of the CardSpring platform. This guy's presenting at TechCrunch Disrupt and he's kind of a jerk off about it. And uh, anyways, Cardify ends up failing and he ends up founding Tinder instead. Um, so like that's, that's sort of the, the, the journey you go through when you're in Silicon Valley for a long time is you just keep crossing paths with people go on to do cool and interesting things. But yeah, Cardspring, we did it for a couple of years. And then ultimately Twitter, who is one of our partners, you know, approached us with an acquisition and they wanted to buy the company. And so in the year 2014, we sold the company to them. Um, and we really thought that Twitter was the, the, the right place for us. You know, it's like a, 
it, it's a really important tenpole tech company. You know, it's like forever going to be an important tech company for better or worse. Um, it has incredible talent and they were really bought in on our mission and wanted to put turbo boosters behind it. So we, we thought that selling the company was the right thing to do. And you stayed for a while. One of my colleagues, uh, Professor Daniel Kim, he studies when uh, startups are acquired by larger companies, whether the talent stays. And of course, vesting is an important piece of that. But um, you, you stayed for a couple of years and, and continued yeah. to do the, the same card stripe stuff, but for, for Twitter. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, first of all, you know, we made a commitment to them, you know, and I, I really believe in making commitments and, and honoring them. And so, you know, I think it's a big deal that they bought our company and they wanted to invest in it. And so, you know, I think it was our responsibility and duty to stay on for, for as long as that commitment was being honored on their side. Um, and, you know, that's not to say that I didn't have opportunities to leave. So Andrew reached out to me. So Andrew, you know, aside from funding Cardspring, obviously his most important company, uh, he also funded this little thing called Slack. So he's best friends with Stuart and he did the seed round and every subsequent round of the company Andrew led, he owned 25% of Slack when they went IPO. He was number two on the Midas list. Like Slack was his baby and he's intimately involved um, until they sold to Salesforce. And so at about a year and one day, he approached me, you know, to grab lunch, um, you know, sort of after the, the cliff had expired and I could conceptually leave. And, you know, I mean, you know, we shot the shit. And then at some point he was just like, why don't you come to Slack? Like Slack's going to be a big winner. You know, we could use you. You could be a director of engineering or something. And I turned him down, you know, um, even though I knew that Slack was going to be a big winner and probably financially was the right move. I just think that, you know, I just think that like we owed it to Twitter to stay longer. And I think it would have been the wrong thing to do and very short-sighted to leave like right afterwards. I mean, Twitter, you know, to its credit is an incredible place. And the network that I made at Twitter is just, astonishingly valuable, you know, and the experience I had at Twitter, and I was really just committed to the place, to be honest. Now, at some point, you know, things changed, right? So um, Dick Costello was the CEO, he was really bought into Card Spring, but, you know, Twitter sort of ran into a rough patch. They basically started slowing down a consumer growth, and then there was a change made atop the company. Dick Costello was, you know, sort of replaced with Jack Dorsey, Jack came back, and as a result, you know, the company priorities sort of shifted overnight and a bunch of efforts, including Twitter commerce and what we were working on were sort of paused. And, you know, as a result, um, you know, I felt like, you know, the commitment had been honored and now it was, it was okay for me to explore the next thing and figure it out. Mm -hmm. and, and the next thing was joining Excel. Now, is this a, a typical path to the uh, VC suite yeah. or is, is this uh, something more unique? Yeah, you know, there, I mean, first of all, there's like so many misconceptions about venture capital, um, you know, but even even inside venture capital, I think there's sometimes misconceptions about, it, but certainly outside, um, you know, my view, even as a founder who is venture backed was that venture capital was sort of like the hall of fame, like you, you start a company, you IPO, and then you sort of graduate to being a venture capitalist canonically like a Reed Hoffman type of character, right? Um, you know, who famously started LinkedIn, IPO the company, and then and then went over to Greylock and is, you know, obviously a fantastic investor. It's not. That's that's sort of the exception of the rule. I mean, the reality is, is that venture capital, particularly today, is like a young person's game. I mean, it's it's a really competitive field. And, you know, you want to be really well networked with sort of the young emerging crew of talent that's that's coming out either from universities or, you know, kind of uh, companies that are collections of talent and emerging. And so, you know, I you know, being at Excel was always a dream job, you know, ever since the first meeting with them, like I always, I always, you know, you sort of fantasize about it a little bit, but I never thought that it was actually like a, a real plausible path for me because I just, I just didn't even know that, you know, they would want someone like me or an engineer. And, you know, I mean, I think, I think there were a couple of things that led to it that I sort of inadvertently was doing that made me more qualified than, than I had perceived. So um, after we had been acquired by Twitter, I started doing some angel investing um, I'd actually been approached by a venture capital firm, which itself was quite shocking to me. Um, but again, I had made a commitment to Twitter. So I decided to go there and like, it wasn't really a decision. Like, you know, I'd made the commitment, so I'm going to go to Twitter. Um, but it really got me thinking that maybe, maybe I should be thinking about it. And so I started doing some angel investing and, you know, uh, YC puts on a conference called angel conf and I attended that. And that was really, really interesting. Um, Excel had put on an API conference. So I went there and met a bunch of folks from Excel that I hadn't previously spent a lot of time with. So that was really interesting. And, you know, just start, just started like taking some sort of um, steps in the direction without a clear plan. But I just kept taking more and more steps in that direction. You know, 
making investments, helping those companies. And then at that, at that lunch with Andrew, um, you know, after he suggested that I should join Slack or, you know, maybe consider starting another company, I, I told him that, you know, I've, I've actually been angel investing. And, you know, if you ever make another investment, I would love to help out that company and, you know, angel invest a little bit aside, you know, beside you. Um, I never thought that that would lead to a job at Excel, but, you know, I think it got him thinking and he started introducing me to other folks at Excel. And then, you know, 10 or 11 months later, um, you know, they made me an offer. Um, I think it really worked out in my favor that for the first six months, I didn't realize they were interviewing me. I thought I was just networking. I had, <laughs> I was at Twitter. I had lots of time for coffees. <laughs> it was great. Um, but, you know, I think, I think they really saw uh, something in me and I'm really grateful for their belief that they had in me to give me this opportunity. Um, I think, you know, there are surprisingly few engineers in venture capital or ex-engineers mm -hmm. in venture capital. I don't think it needs to be that way. I do think being an engineer is an advantage, you know, to some degree, obviously it's the technology field. So like, why wouldn't it be? Uh, but um, I think really being an ex-founder is the most pertinent thing. You know, I think that the reality is the the job and the journey of a founder is so lonely at times. And you know, it really requires a lot of empathy to support a founder. And having been through that moment, I think it gives me an, an ability to empathize with them in a way um, that I don't know that I'd be able to do if I hadn't had the experience. Now, that being said, I mean, there are some extraordinary venture capitalists who are never founders. And I think that, you know, being at Excel and, you know, seeing so many found, you know, venture capitalists from different backgrounds be successful has really showed me that. But I think for me to do the job effectively, I think being a founder was critical. So let's talk about you now evaluating other founders as they're yeah. coming in and pitching you. Are there certain traits or experiences that you really look for? And is there yeah. an Excel model for that? Or is it the Amit model uh, and you just happen to be doing it at Excel? Yeah, yeah I, th I, th I think the, the, the reality is so, you know, we're, we're not very consensus driven. You know, we don't, we don't do votes and we don't, you know, we don't try to do deals that everybody agrees with. We're really a partnership and partners, you know, we trust partners to find, you know, opportunities and invest in those opportunities. And so, you know, sort of by design, it's more the Ameth model than the Excel model. But I think being at a place like Excel and seeing how other, you know, partners practice the job and seeing success cases and founders that are successful um, and obviously, you know, you also over time, you get to see a lot of the outcomes based on all the pitches you saw when you first joined the job. Um, you know, it, it, it is a model that refines over time. And I think being at Excel is, is, has been critical for me to develop that, that model over time. That being said, you know, I think I've, I've always had a really great sense with people, you know, and I've really had the ability to develop conviction in people. You know, over time, I think I've refined po my point of view of like what makes a great founder and certainly one of the core beliefs at Excel is that every founder is an original and, you know, they're not, they're not all going to be Mark Zuckerberg clones, you know, despite whatever happened post that movie coming out and everyone deciding that that's what a founder looks like. You know, I mean, the truth is, is that, you know, we have founders of all shapes and sizes from all backgrounds, all age ranges, all ethnicities. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it really is something that, you know, entrepreneurship can come from anywhere. And, you know, I think the, the characteristics that I look for, um, and, you know, I think everybody has a different list or things that they look for, but I think canonically for me, it's, you know, does this person really understand the problem and do they have an authentic connection to it? And I know that sounds very basic, but you'd be surprised. I think it's very easy to fall in love with a solution or a product without truly understanding the problem. And, you know, if you, if you fall in love with a problem, you can be flexible on the solution. You can change your mind. You know, but if you're fixed on a solution, you're probably going to go down with the ship if you didn't nail it the first time, you know? And so I think that that's like a really important part to me. I think number two is, do I root for this person? You know, and I, I know that sounds silly, but, you know, I think we should all get to a place in our careers where we get to work with people that we really root for and that we really love and care for. You know, um, it's certainly not just a job and it's not certainly just for money. It's you know, I really want to care about what I do. And I put an extraordinary amount of effort into the companies I work with. And so it's really nice to like care about the people I work with. And so that's, that's really important to me. Um, can you hire great people? I think that's more than anything I've learned at Excel is that, is that great companies are basically great collections of talent. And if mm -hmm. you are not a great company builder or you can't evolve a great company builder, it's going to be really tough, you know? And, you know, that's part, part of that's, having a really high bar and standard for talent. But a lot of it is like, what's your, you know, like 
how charismatic are you? Can great people, would great people want to come work for you? You know, and that, you know, I think that's something we all work on over time, right? But that's, that, that to me is really important. Um, how intellectually honest are you? You know, I mean, obviously if you spend enough time on Twitter, you think that everyone's like mega confident and knows everything. And sometimes that bleeds into pitch meetings. Um, but honestly, I think it's so much more fun and, and, and valuable for me to work with people who listen a little bit, who have points of views, who you can actually have a conversation with versus, you know, I mean, certainly it's fine to be along for the ride and hey, the founder does it all. And, you know, we show up once every quarter and that's cool, but that's not really where we're valuable. That's not really where we're effective. And that's not really, that's not really even the fun part. You know, I think the fun mm -hmm. part is really working with someone where, you know, you can learn from them, they can learn from you and you can yeah. be intellectually honest about a situation um, because companies are really difficult and there's no company that's, that's only successful. You know, there's always challenges, there's always trouble. And if you can't be honest about it, I think it's really tough. You know, those are, those are probably the four, the four most, you know, important things that I look for. Notice I didn't say like, you have to have worked at Stripe, <laughs> you know, um, or you had to have gone to UPenn, you know, those mm -hmm. things aren't true. I mean, um, that's just, it's just not the case. I mean, it, it is, it is true that your background being relevant to the problem that you're solving is an input in terms of us thinking like, how authentic are you to the problem space? And why are you deciding that this is the thing that you want to work on? But, you know, I think there's any background that can be effective and, and you know, great for a company. Yeah. So something that keeps coming up both explicitly and implicitly for you is the importance of relationships and people and, and teams and, and, and the like. So how has COVID-19 changed the way you can assess people and interact with people? And, and how do you do your job now? And is that different than before? And will it stay yeah. this way post-pandemic? Yeah, um, it's a fantastic question. And I think the, 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 the honest answer is the jury's out still. Um, I would say the first six months were extremely difficult um, for me. For me personally, I love being around people and to be effectively told that I can't be around people. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really tough. Yeah. Um, so it, it took a lot of energy not to go stir crazy. You know, I, it, it's really tough to build trust over Zoom. You know, we're, we're getting better at it. I think a lot of people are getting better at it, but it's still tough. And I think there's a real human element to being in person and to spending time with people. And I think so much of, so much of what we do is about trust. And I think it's near impossible to do it over Zoom. And so, you know, the first few processes that we did over Zoom, um, you know, honestly, they were mostly with people that we kind of knew or had a relationship with or had spent some time with in, you know, in the real world previously. And then over time, of course, like the world, can't stop and we need to fund new companies and keep finding new opportunities. And so we really adjusted and learned how to do, you know, investments over Zoom. And it's in one sense, it's it's incredibly efficient. It's it's so much more efficient than in person. <laughs> like it's in, I mean, or in order of magnitude. And I think it's one of the reasons that venture capital has exploded as an asset class recently is because mm -hmm. there's just it's so much more efficient to do it over over this sort of uh, Zoom Zoom setup. But you know, for our very best companies, you know, not very best companies, but for, our, I would say our very best processes, where I feel really proud of the process, it was sort of the right combination of a hybrid setup where, yes, there was part of the process that was conducted over Zoom and possibly diligence was conducted over Zoom. But in, in so many cases, you know, we got FaceTime with the person, we flew in to see them, they flew in to see us, or, you know, they didn't fly in to see us, but they happened to be in town and we saw them or whatnot. And so, you know, I'm in, I'm in Las Vegas right now because I'm trying to close a deal and I'm, I'm, I'm spending time with a founder and, you know, it's really hard to convince someone. It's also really hard to convince yourself that this is a good idea that we're entering this marriage for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, you know, and we've never met in person. Now, obviously there's, a, you know, several companies that we have funded um, without having met the founders in person, because that was sort of the nature of the world at the moment. But, mm -hmm. you know, since, since things have opened up a little bit, you know, we've gone and met all of those folks and tried to develop that trust and that foundation, because I think, I think it's the foundation for, for, you know, high performance over time. So, um, Makes sense. even, even beyond founders though, Lori, I would say like, even at Excel, I think it's, it's been tough. It's been tough to build that connectivity. Our job is, you know, somewhat independent, you know, by design in the sense that we, we spend a lot of time with our companies and we're all sort of working on different companies. Um, but I've really treasured the energy in the moments that we've sort of made time to see each other during the pandemic. And I think it's, again, you know, it's a really stressful job. There's lots of difficult decisions and difficult conversations. And if you have a foundation and platform of trust, it makes it much easier. And so I think, 
I think some sort of hybrid setup is probably the future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me give you a chance to do a little bit of uh, prognosticating. Um, what kinds of new technology do you see as the newest or future disruptors? Yeah, it's a really, it, it, well, it's a broad question. Um, I'm mm -hmm. sure there's lots of, there's lots of technologies that are out there. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, it really depends on your definition of disruption, right? I mean, I think, you know, there's certainly a lot of innovation and a lot of talent flooding towards crypto and Web3, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, fundamentally for me, what I find the most intriguing about it is it's really innovation in terms of how humans organize. I mean, if you really think about it, the ways we organize, we only have a few ways that humans are, are, are organizing, you know? I mean, certainly democracy is one of them. Um, and democracy isn't just, you know, your state government or local government or national government, you know, whether it's you know, representative democracy or direct democracy, we use that in so many different ways. I mean, we use that in the HOAs you know, of, our, of our communities. We, we use it like in so many different aspects. What I love about DAOs or, or um, you know, sort of crypto or Web3 is sort of innovating and pioneering new ways for people to cooperate. Uh, so I think that's like a really interesting innovation. This is probably not the answer you were looking for, but I think that we're really seeing technology expand beyond core productivity into every single vertical and every single industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, not here to argue whether that's a good or bad thing, but it's sort of an inevitability at this point is that the true digital transformation of every industry is taking place. And I think that's mm -hmm. why, again, it's one of the factors why there's so much capital flooding into the markets because there's, there's actually so many great companies to be built right now in all of these verticals. And I think that that sort of software eats the world uh, motion is, is really taking place um, mm -hmm. in a lot of markets. Um, and so I think that's, that's another really, really, really exciting category. I, I would say lastly is, you know, and I'm, you know, it's almost a meme at this point, but is sort of AI and machine learning, you know, and I think that it, it's just the potential of AI and machine learning and what it can accomplish. I think we're, we're just, we're not even scratching the surface. And I think that mm -hmm. it's really going to be transformative um, for a bunch of different categories in terms of, you know, driving efficiencies that were not possible before, but also driving huge sort of societal changes um, in terms of, you know, employment and jobs in particular sectors. Um, and, you know, I think we're close to a revolution there. Yeah, yeah. And just let me dig a little further on, on, the, on the fintech side. Uh, so it will, we'll agree that there will be very different ways in which yeah. people will buy things uh, and, and the like. Um, do you think that the startups that we see are ultimately going to eat the incumbents or are they going to just be acquired by incumbents who just build all of this new uh, technology technique into their existing systems? Any sense? Yeah, I mean, I think if you just look at the sort of historical record of, of, of what's taken place, I think you'd have to bet on the latter. You know, I mean, I certainly think that there are a few really sophisticated existing incumbents that will stick around that might, you know, be acquisitive and, and stay relevant, but the, the tech companies are so sophisticated and I think it's more likely for them to sort of verticalize and get their own bank charters and, and provide a better experience than I think it is for the banks to really, you know, get up to speed and, and, and graft technology onto their offering. And so, you know, I say, I say that, you know, with obviously a lot of respect for, um, the existing incumbents and how sophisticated they are and how sophisticated they've ever been, but it's just a paradigm shift, you know? And I think when a paradigm shift happens, it just accelerates the change in a way that the incumbents, it's sort of classic across every single vertical, you know? And so, you know, um, it, it, when, when Twitter and Facebook sort of disintermediated distribution, it allowed a new class of, of media properties to be successful, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas before, before it was sort of um, aggregated at the top because distribution was different. And so, you know, I, I just, I see it happening not only in the United States, but across the world. And I think like you look at something like Robinhood and like, is, is Robinhood going to take over all brokerage? I mean, of course not, but you know, it, it, they're, they're pretty ambitious and smart people. And I think that they're going to keep innovating and keep going. And I think that, you know, a lot of these tech companies are growing so quickly and they're getting to a scale, which it's actually going to be really hard to acquire them, you know, and they're going to go public. And, you know, I think there's more and more belief that there's just an incredible market opportunity ahead of them. So I think it's, you know, if you look at sort of what happened with media and social media and you look at, you know, e-commerce, you know, Amazon was a tiny, tiny little business. 
You look at Netflix, which was a tiny little business, which Blockbuster could have bought. Now Netflix, you know, I mean, I remember, I forget what year it was, every single, every single nominee for the, I think the Golden Globe of Best TV Show was like Amazon or Netflix or something. You know, it's just mm -hmm. like, there's, a, there's an expression I love. It's called, I think it says, um, gradually then suddenly you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's just one of those things where, um, you know, you reach a tipping point and, you know, uh, you look at something like Instacart, you know, getting your groceries delivered sounds crazy. And then something like COVID happens and suddenly it goes mainstream and it's kind of hard to put the genie back in the bottle. And, mm -hmm. you know, yes, Blockbuster launched a Netflix competitor, but it was, it just doesn't matter, you know? And so, you know, I'm sure Safeway or some of the other folks might one day decide like, Hey, we're going to, we'll do our own delivery thing, but the distribution channel has changed and it's much easier for Instacart to replace Safeway with their own grocery store than it is for Safeway to replace Instacart with their own delivery product. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and the economists in the room will, will recognize that this is Joseph Schumpeter uh, and there will be yet another wave, even after Robin Hood gets as big as, as you predict uh, sooner or later, something will, okay. will overtake them as well. So we have about two minutes left before I want to turn this over to the, the live student questions. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to give a little advice to, um, you know, your younger self, in essence, we have grad students as yeah. well as undergrad students here, but if there, there's one piece of advice about maybe uh, VC uh, or finance more generally, but, but then maybe also about learning from uh, setbacks versus successes, let me leave it to you, Amit. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I could really go on forever. I mean, I think there's just so many lessons you learn in life. Um, I would say that maybe the most important thing is that you know, really have the perspective that your career is 40 to 50 years long, you know? And I know that sounds crazy, but you really have a lot of time. And I'm not saying you have a lot of time, so be lazy about it, but I'm saying this game is 40 to 50 years long, so play accordingly. So, you know, what that means is maybe in the early part of your career, you should be more about accumulating assets, AKA building up your skills, putting yourself in difficult situations so you can grow, even if you don't have that massive financial success right out the gates, you know, working at a working at a high velocity startup uh, can be one of the most impactful things for your own personal growth. Um, and, and just realize that you have multiple shots at it, you know, and the goal in life is not to start a company if you so choose to be an entrepreneur, but to start a successful company. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you don't get any points for starting at that company at 22 versus 24 or 26, you get points for that company being really successful. So, you know, if you need to spend two or three or four or five years at a, at a great company, you know, like a Stripe or, you know, a Robin Hood or a Headway or a Scale or a Segment, then do that because I think that maximizes your chance that you'd be successful at it. The other, the other piece of advice I'd give you is, you know, when you're, when you're in school, you know, you're sort of at a place where, you know, when you're in high school, you got to get a great SAT score or ACT score, and then you got to get into a great college, and then you got to get great internships, then you got to get a great job. And the sort of like the things that you're supposed to do sort of run out you know, and, and now you're figuring out your own rubric mm -hmm. and you're trying to figure out what matters to you. And as someone who mentors 132 students between the ages of 20 and 24, I'll tell you, like, that's a, that's a struggle that everyone struggles with. I struggle with it. I think lots of people struggle with it. It's figuring out what I'm supposed to do, what, what my purpose is. And I would say, just be kind to yourself and try to be as intentional as you can about figuring that out. And, you know, you'd be surprised like in the real world, like how few people stand out or put in the extra effort. And it's just, it's so dramatic, the outputs and outcomes you can have if you do that, you know? There's no way I'd be a VC today if I just wasn't like, hey, like, let me try angel investing. There are lots of people who say they wanna be a VC and there are very few people who actually put in like even a modicum of effort towards getting there. There are a lot of people who say they wanna be founders, but there are very few people who actually put in a modicum of effort to actually getting there. And so, you know, if you really set your heart on one thing, I'm like almost effectively convinced you can do it, like whatever it is. Um, can't do everything, that's, that's a little harder. But if you really have one thing in mind and you take steps in that direction, I think you're like more likely than not to actually be able to get there. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And that's so wonderful for our, our students to hear from you, because I think being in these elite environments where everybody seems so accomplished, it, 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 
it can sometimes be uh, unmotivating for people rather than motivating. But then as everyone goes out into the world again, they recognize how much they're capable of doing. So be kind to yourself uh, and, and do the things that you love. That's just wonderful advice. I've so enjoyed getting to know you and I, I can see why you're so successful at, at what you do. Sales is behind every part of what you do, being able to sell your ideas and your vision. And uh, it, it's clear that you enjoy that piece of it as well. So it's, it's been my pleasure to speak with you, Amit, and I'm going to turn it over to Sabrina to uh, bring some student questions to you. Best wishes. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, that was great. Thank you for leading the fireside chat. Um, Amit, thank you so much for that little note of um, kind of wisdom that you imparted on us. Um, we have quite a lot of interest from the audience about your VC experience and on how you evaluate startups. Um, yeah. I want to start off with Daniel. Do you mind unmuting yourself and asking your question? Hey, Amit. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time, uh, time with us. I'm working on ClearList. It's a stock market for startups of any stage. So we're trying to um, help startups um, fundraise more efficiently and bring liquidity to all stakeholders, um, regardless of um, including employees. And so I was just curious, uh, what's your, how do you find startups? What's your sourcing process at, like at Excel? Yeah, um, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of like, if you think about the life of VDC, we do like four things, right? Um, well, we go to happy hours. So the five things, okay. Five things we do. Uh, the first thing is we source deals. Uh, the second thing is we evaluate deals. The third thing we do is we have to win deals. That's actually way harder than it sounds. And the last thing is, you know, we have to help those companies. And, you know, actually a lot of effort is put in that last bucket. But sourcing deals is a big part of it. Um, and, you know, if you, don't, if you don't source, if you're not a great sourcer, it's really tough. Like it almost doesn't matter how good you are at evaluating. If you're not getting in front of great opportunities and great companies, you know, you could be the best picker in the world. But if you just never got a chance to pick a great company, it doesn't matter. Um, there's all sorts of tactics. You know, and there's no one size fits all. And I think, you know, one of the things that you have to do when you go into venture capital is figure out what your strategy is. And I think, you know, the first the sort of lowest hanging fruit and the high signal thing is people that you know, great people that you know. And so, you know, there's a lot of people, um, you know, that I, that I meet in, in colleges who are like, I want to be a venture capitalist. I'm like, great, go operate, like go into the real world, like build out a network, build out a network of future founders and build trust with them and, and, and have them think that you're great. <laughs> and, you know, so for, for me, the most important thing I can do is to build relationships with the people I already know so that I am their first phone call when they start a company. That is like my number one job. If someone I know who is fantastic doesn't call me when they start a company, I have fundamentally failed, right? So that's number one. Number two is, you know, I, I'm very good at taking advantage of situations like I was at Twitter and I, you know, I mean, I think networking can be a dirty, dirty word sometimes, but I really built relationships with a ton of people at Twitter. And so, um, and I think part of, part of my job is like being very open-minded to meeting new people and developing those relationships with new people. So I think there's a lot of, you know, sort of SDR work in terms of, you know, being open-minded and taking conversations with people you don't know and referrals from other people you trust to meet great people. There's a lot of customer success in terms of just developing those relationships and investing in them for a long period of time. You know, that's, that's sort of the core of what all venture capital is. Now, on top of it, there's lots of tactics, right? So, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of incubators and seed investors and angel investors who will happily send you their deals because they want to mark up. And so, you know, I think part of the exercise is developing trusted relationships with really good, you know, upstream people um, who can send you really high quality deals, whose, whose taste you trust, who, who give it to you straight. And I think that's like, obviously like another great way to do it. And then, you know, one of the reasons to work at a place like Excel is that most people actually will just reach out to you, you know? And so right now I'm sort of the, at least my, my website says I'm the crypto and healthcare and FinTech person at Excel. And so everybody who's starting a crypto FinTech or healthcare company effectively reaches out, you know, for the most part, right? And they want to talk to you. And so I think that's one of the advantages of being at a great brand. And so, you know, outside of that, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of tactics about, you know, one of the things that we do at Excel is we're very thesis driven. And so we, we try to develop a specialty in an area. And so I wrote our healthcare thesis, for example. And as part of writing that healthcare thesis, I met with so many of the, the folks who are in and around healthcare. And so you start developing a reputation as, hey, like there's a partner at Excel who looks at healthcare, right? And so inevitably word gets around and people start reaching out to you. 
And then if you do one or two deals in that category, then you know, very obviously people reach out to you. I mean, think of it the other way around, right? Like if you're a founder, you're starting a healthcare company, you probably just go down all the top VCs and hey, who at this firm looks at healthcare? And that's that's sort of how it works. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of tactics that that you can employ, but I would say that your own personal network is probably the best one. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Um, so building off Ahmed of um, kind of how you mentioned fintech and how that's just specialization, um, Manav, I believe you had a question about um, kind of blockchain functionality. Would you like to chime in? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Ahmed, thanks for doing this. Uh, I work at a company called MedStack. Uh, since you mentioned you're the head of healthcare at uh, Excel, uh, we make it easier for uh, you know any digital health company to get compliant. So just a little plug over there, I'm part of the BDR team. Anyway, um, one of the questions I had was, what do you think the UI and application layer of Web3 apps are gonna look like in order for the average person to take advantage of the blockchain functionality? Because as we know, adoption is still in its infancy, right? But at the same time, the average person isn't necessarily the most tech literate. So how do we bridge that gap and bring the advantages of Web3 to everyone? Yeah, I mean, the honest truth is I don't know. And, you know, I think founders sort of build the future and we, we buy into the vision. I would say that, you know, if you, if you look at other parallels in different arenas, you know, I, I sort of am older and come from the era of like, well, we had to build our own computers and, you know, you had to know so many weird little intricacies of Windows to be able to like install applications and uninstall them. And, you know, Apple's just like, why are we making this complicated? Let's just make it really simple for people and like actually abstract away a lot of the guts underneath. And I think, you know, I have a, I have a similar point of view for blockchain and, you know, all of this work. Like, I mean, you know, MetaMask is a really interesting tool, but it's like very um, inaccessible, I would say, for the average person. And so I would say that, you know, when we get to a place where we're able to build consumer grade experiences with, you know, sort of the underlying technology that has the sort of baked in benefits that, you know, that people are attracted to about Web3 and blockchain, then I think it could actually reach the mainstream. But it's about, it's about simplifying things, not making them more complicated. But I mean, of course, you know, you have to start complicated before you get simple. Sense. Um, just to quickly follow up on that, um, you know, we know COVID-19 has really changed enterprise IT spending patterns, but how do you think it's changed the landscape for B2C companies and how investors view B2C companies, especially since households now have an unparalleled savings rate and so many other things going for them uh, as you, as an investor, how's that changed the way you look at these B2C companies? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think I think there's just more and more money moving online. And I think that's like an inevitable shift. And, you know, maybe COVID-19 has accelerated a lot of that. I think B2C is too broad a category to have a singular point of view. I mean, within B2C, you have e-commerce, D2C, you have, you know, digital health, you have, I mean, there's just so many different categories within it. Um, and I think COVID-19, like most, you know, significant societal changes probably benefited certain categories and hurt certain categories, you know? Um, and, you know, like travel, travel is a category that was like obliterated, you know, effectively by, by COVID-19. It was a really difficult period for a lot of companies. And there were, you know, other categories like, you know, Instacart and home delivery, <laughs> which, you know, exploded or e-commerce, which exploded. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's, you know, I don't know that, I don't know that we're investing on the basis of COVID-19 or saying that this is a huge shift that has happened, but, you know, I think it's, emboldened some of our previous theses about, you know, e-commerce or other such categories or digital health, you know, like for, for example, in digital health, you know, now insurance is reimbursing telehealth at the same rates as in-person care, right? That's a huge change. And through COVID-19, some of those changes have been made permanent. So that, that shift helps us gain even more conviction in a category like digital health. But I think you have to have a point of view in those individual categories. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you, Manav. Um, I'm in, up next, we have uh, Dat. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, yeah, you got it. Thank you. Hi, Amit. Uh, my name is Dat. I am a second year master's student studying data science. Um, my question is about a company called SoCure. They, um, this is a platform for digital identity verification. So they combat frauds using machine learning and AI. Uh, they closed a Series D funding led by Axel in March, yeah. I believe. 
Could you share some of the investment strategies behind this investment and what do you think about the industry in general? It's a really specific question, Dad. <laughs> uh, okay, well, sort of. I can I can kind of answer your question. I'm not on the investment team that invested in SoCure. SoCure was let out of our growth fund. I'm a partner in the venture fund. But I would say in general, um, you know, as more and more, well, I mean, let me let me try to answer it in a different way. Um, your digital life is getting more and more complicated, and you know the now the number of digital tools, particularly digital financial products you're using, is 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 you know, growing exponentially, not just you, but sort of everyone. And a very key component of sort of the, the stability of, of those sorts of products is a really, a really robust compliance program. And so there are a lot of folks in that category alongside SoCure. SoCure is a, a wonderful company. We're delighted to be investors and it's a, a, a true rocket ship. But, you know, alongside SoCure, there are other companies. There's a company called Unit 21. There's a company called Alloy. You know, there's a comply advantage. There are a bunch of companies that are going after the space around KYC. KYC stands for know your customer, um, anti-money laundering restrictions and regulations. And I think that, you know, as the government gets more and more sophisticated about protecting individuals, you know, rights or data rights, or as they get more and more sophisticated around protecting individuals from fraud, I think you're going to see more and more companies like Secure, which are there to act as that sort of layer. And so I think that that they're writing so many, so many trends right now in terms of the explosion of financial services and products, the sort of increased regulation that's that's happening, not just in the United States, but sort of globally. I mean, I think it's it's, it's a great company um, and it's really down the, the fairway for, for something that we invest in. Awesome, we, thank you so much. We in particular, we love these sorts of enabling technologies. Like that is, you know, we love APIs. Like we're investors in a business called Mux. Mux is sort of a video encoding API and it powers pretty much everybody who does uh, does digital video. Um, you know, we love those sorts of enabling technologies. We were investors in a business called Checker, which is sort of an API for background checks, which is sort of powering all of on demand and allows these businesses to onboard lots of drivers um, and workers uh, very quickly. So so cure for us is like really, really right down the middle. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Um, and I wanted to chime in for Richard, who unfortunately had to um, leave first, but he's asking, what advice would you give climate impact focused tech startups um, for the specific niche? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I, I sort of grew up during the era of the first sort of climate boom in terms of venture capital and a lot of companies lost money. And I think it's because, you know, at the end of the day, you have to build a sustainable business. And I think right now we're really seeing an inflection point in terms of talent, in terms of, and by the way, like for me, it's always talent. Talent is the leading indicator and there's just so many talented people going into climate right now, but there's an inflection point in terms of venture interest, funding, um, breakthroughs in terms of technology. I mean, there are a lot of really great climate companies. And so, um, you know, and obviously like larger and larger companies like Stripe are, are putting a lot of effort into funding a lot of those breakthroughs and you know, carbon credits, like we're really reaching a tipping point, not only in terms of the severity and importance of the crisis and the urgency behind it, but also sort of the technology innovation that's happening. And so, you know, I mean, what, what advice? I would probably give you a lot of general purpose company building advice, which is, you know, get great investors, build a great team, have a really clear point of view as to how you can build something sustainable and, and execute against it. I don't know that there's anything specific about climate that I would say uh, that I wouldn't say to build any other great company. Um, I would just say that, you know, don't forget the company building part of it just because you're working on such an important mission. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and Richard, if you're watching this later on, I hope that answers your question. Um, Ria, I believe you had a question. Yes, thank you so much. And thanks so much, Amit, for speaking to us on a Tuesday evening. Really appreciate your time. Um, I'm a first year uh, MBA student at Wharton, and I worked at a fintech startup before this. So your idea about technology uh, influencing everything or daily lives internationally re really resonated with me. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, just zooming out a little bit, what are the mega trends that you see affecting our interactions with technology, specifically in the next three to five years, not just in the US, but also internationally? Yeah, I think the number one thing on my mind is remote work. I mean, I think it's I think it's inevitable. I think that we're just in a completely new era. And I don't, I mean, I think it's really hard to overstate what a significant shift it is and like what what the impact is going to be on humanity. 
you know, we've we've sort of been anchored in various cities for economic opportunity, whether it's, you know, Detroit was an auto town or Silicon Valley, San Francisco was a tech town. And, you know, I just think that we're just in a completely new paradigm now where economic opportunity isn't necessarily going to be tied to your geographical location. And I think that there are going to be people who live in all different parts of the country or the world and get access to those opportunities. And so, you know, certainly like the future of work and work productivity, I think has to adjust accordingly um, and how we organize and how we, you know, collaborate, um, how folks are incentivized, like all of those shifts are really going to play out. I mean, there's so many categories that are emerging from this. There's you know, companies that are focused specifically on, well, how do you just hire people in other countries, right? And how do you actually build your HR kind of infrastructure across those countries? And there's, you know, there's a company that we invested in called Remote, which is a really exceptional company in that category. There's another company that's also an exceptional company called Deal. Um, there are a bunch of folks focused on that particular problem. You know, we're investors in a company called Hopin, which is sort of a crazy fast growing company, uh, which, which helps organize online events. There's a company uh, that I believe Sequoia invested in called Gathered Up Town, which is some sort of like cross between this, like a Zoom and like a Legend of Zelda video game where you have this like digital space where you exist and you can like walk your little character up to someone else's character and then you can have a conversation. And it's sort of, it's, it's sort of skeuomorphic in terms of it gives you like an analogy to like what a real space would be, but it's not. And so I just, I think that that change is, 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 is seismic. Um, you know, it's going to impact so many aspects of, of who we are, you know, whether it's dating, whether it's real estate, whether it's travel, you know, all of it. I mean, I, I, I'm, I think I'm going to go to Europe for like 10 days and just work from there. And I think I can do it. And it's, that's crazy. Um, you know, and I, I, I think it's actually a lot broader than, than we expect. It's not just, it's not just like engineers who want to like work from somewhere alone. Like that's not, that, that stereotype is sort of mis, misplaced. I mean, I would never have expected that venture capital could be something that could be done, quote unquote, remotely. And, you know, I mean, I, I definitely believe it's more of a hybrid role. And obviously, like, I think you have to show up and be in person, but I think it's a lot more feasible than we expected. And so um, I, I would say this is the defining shift for the next three to five years. I mean, you know, it's, it's like going through 9-11 and being like, well, what's the most important thing for the next three to five years? I mean, it really is this. Like, we're going through a global pandemic and it is... I mean, it's been going on for two years effectively, right? Like it's crazy. And so I, I think this is like the first, second, third and fourth answer on my list. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, that Thank makes you, a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so I guess we're wrapping up now. So last question, um, but going back to kind of the question from Richard, which asked about uh, climate impact. Hunter, I believe you're also running something climate related if you want to chime in. Thanks for this great conversation. Um, yeah, I'm Hunter. We're working on uh, climate risk um, for the emerging mandate by the federal government to require every company to just quantify and disclose their climate risk. I guess I'm wondering like how you guys think about climate and generally if you have an investment thesis specifically. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, I mean, I think you know, I sort of hinted at it previously, I, I would say like for us, you know, we're very partner driven and individual partners can push the partnership in any direction they want. And so, you know, no one, no one effectively told me to write our healthcare thesis. I just saw an opportunity there and decided to go pursue it. And, you know, we've made a couple of investments and we'll probably make a couple more. You know, the leading indicator for me here is the talent and some of my most talented friends and colleagues are, you know, really dedicating their careers to climate. And so, you know, there are a number of us now that are thinking about climate from a thesis point of view and an investment point of view. And it's probably something that's going to play out over the next year or two or three years as we like develop a point of view and a perspective where, where we can invest. Um, beyond that, I mean, I actually, I actually, there's even conversations within Excel about our own sort of climate footprint and how we think about it, not just as investors, but as an organization, as people. Um, and, you know, there's probably more to come from us on that, uh, but it's something that we've given a lot of thought to as well. Thanks. Amazing, and I think that's a wrap to our Q and A. Um, everyone, I'm going to hand this over to Vivek Amit. Thank you so much for doing this Q and A with me, um, Vivek. If you want to do closing statements, yeah, of course, I would love to. And I have to say, this has been such an insightful discussion. So, of course, thank you, Amit, for actually taking the time to be here with us today. And 
I have to say, we all must have learned so much from your experience and your brutally honest advice to all of us. Um, and hopefully this will mold the next generation of, you know, maybe not young, but successful entrepreneurs. Um, thank yeah. you, Professor Rosenkopf, for helping moderate this incredible discussion and go extremely smoothly. And a huge shout out to my co-pres, Sabrina, as well, for the wonderful Q&A. Um, so I think that's a wrap, everyone. Uh, what we usually do is we have like a follow-up, you know, discussion after all of our Zoom meetings. So feel free to stick around if you want. Um, but thank you, Amit. Thank you, Professor Rosenkopf. And thank you, for, thank you to the audience for showing up. And enjoy the rest of your day.